Good morning. I'm Tamara Shoemaker. Um, if you follow my Facebook page, you'll have seen that I'm getting ready to go face a rather large, huge speed bump today in the form of a praxis test that needs to be passed in order for me to graduate with a teaching license by next May. Um, I don't test well, usually, especially when there's a time clock um, attached and I have seconds to think of the answer. And anyway, it just all the answers just leave my head when I have a time clock attached. So I'm really feeling the pressure this morning. 21 years ago, I was an English education major and uh, for my undergrad undergraduate degree, I dropped the education part of my major because of this praxis. Um, I just couldn't pass it. I did. I couldn't face the test um, and I was really terrified of it. So here I am 21 years later, trying again to face this giant with only slightly less terror so when I opened my Bible this morning, um, instead of heading directly to Joshua 7, as I had intended, I went instead to a well-known giant story that um, I found in 1 Samuel 17. And most of us know this story. Most of us have heard of David and Goliath. And it's one of the first stories that we learn in Sunday school. Um, it's one of the first stories we're taught as children, right? Um, I used to love the flannel graph pictures that my teacher would put up on the board, little tiny David on one side with a sling in his hand, and then massive armor-clad, javelin-wielding, decked-out Goliath on the other side. So when my husband and I were in Ireland, one of the things we did was to start a Sunday school for one of the small house churches that we worked with. And I have pictures of my husband with one of the kids on his shoulders to kind of represent the giant Goliath, facing off with one of the youngest kids in the class. Um, and who was less than half the height of both of the, you know, of them together. So the kids loved the story. They had great fun acting it out. And we all had um, a good lesson on David and Goliath and kind of just re reenacting the story. So this morning I realized that I'm so familiar with the story that it's actually been years since I've read the original story. So I went back to read it just, you know, to kind of refresh. Um, a quick summation of the story. <clears throat> We've got nine plus foot Goliath, who's standing on a hillside, um, backed by the Philistine army. He's shouting epithets against Israel in general, and Israel's God in particular, and he's demanding that they send a champion out to face him in one-on-one -on -one battle. And what does Israel, supposedly God's chosen people, what do they do? Rather than standing on their favored status as God's chosen people, they crouch on the opposite hillside. Um, not one of them is daring to go face the giant until David, right? Young, handsome, ruddy David shows up on the scene. He's not expecting to fight giants that day, but whatever, right? You know, no big deal. He looks at the giant. He takes note of the fact that the giant is insulting the God of Israel. He looks around at the cowering people who are supposed to be the people of God, the chosen people of God, and he wants to know why nobody's doing anything about it. Eliab is David's older brother, and he was, a while ago, he was passed over being anointed as the next king of Israel um, sometime back because, um, and David was anointed in his place. And so there seems to be a little bit of um, sibling rivalry here, maybe a little bit of jealousy, um, maybe guilt over the fact that, you know, he's not one of the heroes of Israel standing up to the giant. So anyway, he finds David and he, he, he hears David talking to um, all the Israelites around him, the Israelite army around him. And so he taunts him. He's like, go, go back home. What are you doing here anyway? And David shrugs it off as only David can. He says, now what have I done? Can I even talk? And so he ignores his older brother. He keeps on asking the same questions until enough attention is brought on him that he gets taken to King Saul, right? King Saul sends for him. Who, who's this guy talking about, you know, what's going on? Well, it turns out Saul's familiar with David because David's been employed to play his harp for the king to soothe him sometimes when the king gets depressed and angry. Um, so when David walks in, Saul sees who it is. Oh, it's David. David's the one who's been asking questions. He shakes his head. You're just a boy. You can't handle the giant. So David yanks out his resume. He hands it to the king, points to the highlights. See here? Killed a king. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Killed a bear with my bare hands. <laughs> Killed a lion and I ain't lion. <laughs> Sorry, that coffee I drank this morning's really kicking in. So anyway, <laughs> oh, that was good. Um, King Saul is reluctantly convinced and he orders his own tunic put on David. He gives him a coat of armor and a bronze helmet. David straps on a sword around, around him. He tries walking around, but the Bible says he's not used to them. I can't go in these, he says to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he takes them off. 
He takes his staff in his hand. He chooses five smooth stones from the stream. He puts them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approaches the Philistine. That's from 1 Samuel 17, 39 to 40. So, as I've been thinking about this giant I'm facing, right, this test that's coming up, and especially over the last week, I've dived into what most people call cramming, right, panic-driven. Um, I've been scouring my textbooks and the internet, looking up anything and everything that has to do with my, what might possibly be on the test, been trying to rememorize everything, struggling to prepare, and in the mad rush to do everything, I realized I was accomplishing nothing at all. <laughs> so rather than feeling prepared, I felt confused and weighed down. I couldn't remember anything that I'd spent all this time looking up. I glanced over the massive array of weapons available to me via Google, ETS.com, PDF, um, textbooks, more more things. I've, I tried to strap them all on at once and I couldn't move beneath the weight. So yesterday when my mom asked me if I was planning to spend the evening studying, right? I shrugged. I said, nope. <laughs> so rather than weighing myself down beneath the myriad avenues of too much information, I'm going back to my resume. Facing the lion, I passed both my earlier tests that I needed to uh, pass, praxis, math praxis, and there was a, a, a different one that I had to pass too. Um, hand wrestled the bear. I have a 4.0 GPA with all my earlier classes and all my practicums. Neither of these things I've done on my own strength by myself. Both of those things I've done only in the I'm not that, you know, I'm not that smart. I'm, I have a passing intellect, but the only reason I am where I am is because the Lord has brought me here. He's helped me to conquer those things step by step by step. So here's the deal. David wasn't nine plus feet, right? He didn't carry a bronze helmet on his head or wear a coat of scale armor um, made out of bronze that weighed 125 pounds. He didn't wear bronze greaves on his legs or carry a bronze javelin on his back. He didn't carry a spear shaft that's so thick it's as thick as a weaver's rod. He didn't have an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. He didn't have a shield bearer who walked around with him, you know, carrying a shield for him because it's so huge. And his enemy did have all those things. Goliath was pretty intimidating and huge and overwhelming. And if David had focused solely on what his enemy had, David would have turned tail and run away. So here's what David focuses on instead. He strides up to the meeting place with Goliath and nothing but his own tunic, a shepherd's bag filled with five smooth stones, a staff, and a sling. And when the massive giant walks down the hill toward him, taunting him with words that say, come here and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Rather than running away, David says this, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Zechariah 4, 6 later on in the Bible, says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So David recognizes that the victory wasn't his when he fought the lion and the bear, and he gives credit where credit is due. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David recognizes that what happens now has nothing whatsoever to do with armor thickness or spear weight or anything else, and so he refuses them. What happens now is solely down to the age-old fight between the enemy and God. And so David stands against the enemy in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, the God of the armies of Israel. And he stands against the enemy in the name of the same God, who I may say is the God of angel armies. If you look at Second uh, Kings 6.17, where Elisha prays for his servant to be able to see, and the Lord opens the servant's eyes, and he can see the hills full of the fiery horses and chariots of the Lord of heaven. So whatever test you're facing today, whether it's a literal one, like the one I'm getting ready to go conquer, or a metaphorical one, don't focus on armor weight, right? 
You're not used to it. I'm not used to it. It's going to weigh us down. Focus on this. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord, is the Lord's, and he will give all of whatever you're facing into our hands. So David hit the giant on the first try. The rock sank into the giant's forehead, not because David was just that good, right? But because he stood against the enemy in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of angel armies. And the Lord fought the fight for him. So hope that encourages you today. I'm excited to get this giant out of the way. Um, so tomorrow, when the giant is out of the way, I will go back to Joshua, the next chapter. All right, I'll see you then.